Well, good morning, everyone. Glad to be back. And uh, it was great to have Isaiah with us last Sunday. Hope that you were all able to hear his message from the book of Ephesians. Uh, just uh, uh, good, good to have him with us. He was supposed to be here physically, but due to the pandemic, um, he was able to do it virtually. So we thank Isaiah for sending that message along. Uh, would you please be in prayer for um, Jessica Weaver has some cracked bones in her foot and uh, Lily uh, Alvarez had also had um, a broken leg and so we ask you to pray for them. Daphne Kazubo had a broken ankle and let's see, there was one other, oh yes, please pray for Claudette Hughes as she goes in for surgery uh, here in the next week or so. Um, this morning, I would like to speak to you about God's grace at a wedding. Two weeks ago, we were talking about God's grace in a vineyard uh, this morning in a, in a, in a wedding ceremony. Uh, I have to look back on, on my wedding day as a great time, a great day. It was, I believe, the second greatest day of my life, number one being the day that I came to know Jesus Christ as my Savior. But my wedding was definitely a great day. Um, I did not anticipate it being as much fun as it was. I thought it was more for the bride, but it was just a great day of uh, celebrating with all the people that came. We had a bagpiper in our wedding, and of course that was a little bit unique, and he piped Janelle down the aisle and, and then was also playing Amazing Grace and some other songs afterwards. Uh, we had some relatives come from Scotland for the wedding, so that was a real thrill. And since they were at the house, we went over to the house after the, after the wedding ceremony and reception for a little while. Got in the car, and about 10 minutes down the road, it broke down, my 63 Chevy. And so we had to come up with another plan. And, uh, but in spite of all of that, we just had a, a great time at our wedding ceremony. Um, 2.4 million Americans every year get married. I'm not sure what it will be this year in light of the circumstances. I was just talking to Rose Johnson and Rose and Chris are still planning on getting married on August the 1st. They have two different options and we'll find out a little bit more about that later um, depending on what happens with things uh, beginning to open up. Uh, so pray for Rose and Chris as they plan their wedding. It's uh, a day that everyone looks forward to, and it's been a difficult time for, for uh, those weddings that have been taking place in the last couple of months. Twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars now is the cost for a wedding. Uh, a lot of that goes to the venue and the food. Um, it's quite a bit just when you add in all of the people, all of the guests that are invited. And so it's very expensive. Seventy-seven percent of people getting married today actually live together before they get married, which of course would violate uh, biblical principles, God being the one who has established marriage. And uh, so this morning, uh, Jesus is in the temple. He's still teaching. Uh, and he's spoken two parables that really slammed the elders and the Pharisees, the scribes, and they understood and knew that he was speaking about them in these parables, and so they want to get rid of him, but they're afraid because of all the people that are gathered around who would view him as a prophet. And so, as a result, they're intending to try and trap him. So he begins to speak a third parable, and he says in chapter 22, verse one, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. So in this parable, we're going to find a king, his son, a wedding celebration, a feast, which in those days would last for about a whole week. But the main subject of this parable has to do with the kingdom of heaven. He's comparing God's kingdom to a wedding celebration. And so in light of the fact that uh, uh, so many people today um, may not understand the whole purpose of, of marriage and weddings, I, I thought I'd take just a couple of minutes to describe to you uh, seven purposes of marriage that are given in God's word, because that's where we need to go if we want information about marriage and about weddings. And most people will plan a lot of t spend a lot of time planning a wedding ceremony, but they don't spend very much time 
planning their marriage. And the marriage is to last a lifetime. The wedding may last an hour to four or five hours, depending on how long the reception is. So Genesis 2.18, God's word tells us that, um, that it is not good for man to be alone. Those are God's words. Uh, God had created the universe, the world. He had created all of the animals and created man. And as he looked out, he saw the aloneness of man. And so God, for the purpose of removing the loneliness, created a woman. And in 2.18, we find the word God, it is not good for the man to be alone. And so God was establishing a companion for the man because of the aloneness that the animal world could not satisfy. And so he created this woman. A woman who would be much like the man, but also in many ways different from the man. Secondly, we find in Genesis 2, 21 to 24, God's word says that a man is to leave his parents and to cleave to his wife, his spouse. And it goes on to say there that the two shall become one. So there's a, some sense in which when two people are married, they join together, they become emotionally one, physically one, and hopefully spiritually one. God's pattern, God's plan of completing the man and the woman was to take the two and to help them or make them become one. I have found over the years that for many people start their relationship at the wrong end. There is a physical relationship that takes place long before that should happen. But it is definitely part of the intimacy and the oneness in the completion of the two. In Genesis 1.28, God's word also tells us uh, about the whole idea of procreation. God did not make several million people. He made two people. He made them one and designed them in such a way that they would have children, that they would give birth, and they would multiply. And so the first command in scripture is to be fruitful and multiply, found in Genesis 1.28. Scripture also tells us that marriage is for pleasure. In 1 Corinthians 7.33, it says, a married man is to be concerned about pleasing his wife. And in Deuteronomy 24, it says that when a man gets married, he's not to leave or go away for a year for the primary purpose of keeping his wife happy, of pleasing his wife. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 2, the Apostle Paul, aware that there's so much immorality going on, sexual relationships taking place outside of marriage, that he writes, since there is so much immorality, get married. And so one of the purposes of marriage is to prevent immorality from taking place. The sixth purpose is the transmission of truth, to pass truth from one generation to the next. Parents' primary responsibility is to teach their children. They're the number one, the primary teachers of their kids. And yet the most important truth that they are to pass on or pass down to their children, the next generation, is the truth about God and his word. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 6, it tells us there about when you're lying down, when you're sitting, when you're walking, when you're standing, when you rise up, all of these opportunities to teach the children about God's word. And then number seven, Ephesians chapter five, where God's word says, wives submit your, to your husbands as to the Lord, and husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. And he tells us in that passage of scripture that the church is his bride and we are to treat our spouses, we are to love our wives in the same way that Jesus Christ loved the church. And at the end of that passage, he tells us he's not primarily speaking about marriage, he's talking about the relationship between Jesus and his church. So it's a picture. So those are seven purposes of, of marriage that I think are very important uh, for us to, to understand. 
In Matthew chapter 19, Jesus affirms what we just read in Genesis. In, Gen in Matthew 19, Jesus was asked a question about divorce and he answered and said, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And also went on to say, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Jesus says, what therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. So Jesus is affirming what we read in Genesis. Uh, when we moved down to Visalia, I happened to go ahead and, and uh, print out some information about the state of California. And when two people are desirous, desiring to get married, they're required to get a license. And on that license, you have to have your name and your residence and the date and the time. And you have to have two witnesses who sign that they were there at your wedding ceremony. California Code 308.5, and this was in 2006 when we moved here, said only marriage between a man and a woman is valid or recognized in California. And we know that that has changed since then as we have distorted the plan and the blueprint of God. Those who obtain a marriage license must do so from the county clerk, and it must show the identity of the two parties, their real and full names, place of residence, and their ages. You will not be granted a marriage license if you are under the influence of an intoxicating liquor or narcotic drug, and that's Family Code Section 352. And then one other that I thought was interesting, section or code 420 says, the parties shall declare in the presence of the person solemnizing the marriage and in the presence of necessary witnesses that they take each other as husband and wife. So there is a declaration, there are eyewitnesses. Uh, it's a very important um, commitment that two people are making towards each other when they make the decision to get married. And so as Jesus is presenting this parable, remember in Matthew 21 and 22, he had come down to Jerusalem, the triumphal entry, uh, a couple of days later, the temple cleansing, and now we find him in the temple teaching. There were three parables. Two weeks ago, we saw the parable about the two sons. When the father said to one son, go into the vineyard and work. And he said, I will not, but he did. And the second son, when he told him to go in, he said, I will, but he didn't. And Jesus asked these scribes, these elders, who did the father's will? And the only answer was the first son. And Jesus compared them to the prostitutes and the tax collectors, those who were outwardly initially rebellious toward the things of God, but changed their hearts, responded positively to obeying God. Whereas the others, the other son represented those religious, self-righteous traditionalists who were counting on their religion. They were outwardly willing, but inwardly rebelling and did not go work in the vineyard. The second parable had to do with the vineyard workers. And this man, this wealthy landowner had planted a vineyard and, and uh, he hired some workers and their job was to take care of it and grow the crops. And when it was time for the harvest, he sent servants to receive the produce. And as a result of their arrival, uh, they were beaten and one was killed. And then he sent another group, his grace towards these individuals. And they did the same thing. And finally, he sends his son. If you remember two weeks ago, they killed the son and the son in the parable is a reference to Jesus. And so the Pharisees, when they're asked what should be done, and they said, these wretches should come to a wretched end. And finally, they understood he was speaking about them. And now we come to the parable of the wedding. It's a royal wedding. A royal wedding where you would be happy to be invited, to be a guest at this wedding. 
Remember several years ago, the whole world was anticipating the wedding of Charles and Diana, and then eventually William and Kate, and then Harry and Meghan. A royal wedding is a special event, and to be privileged enough to go and attend to be a guest of a royal wedding. And that's the setting of this parable. The story is mostly about the invitation that's given to the guests. The story is not really so much about the son. It's not about the groom or the bride. It's about the guests. But please remember that the primary subject of this parable has to do with the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven, not a kingdom on earth, even though it's a king in the parable, this is a reference to God. He's the king. And it's an invitation to his kingdom that is the purpose of this parable. So the king is God, the son is Jesus, the bride is never mentioned in the parable, the guests refer to the nation of Israel and primarily the leaders of the nation of Israel, but the nation as a whole that had been called by God way back in the time of Abraham to be his chosen people. The servants that you find in this parable are God's messengers. And then there's a reference also to the wedding clothes. So we find in this passage God's gracious, and I want to focus on, again, God's gracious invitation to a world of sinful people, to his kingdom. That's behind the story, behind the parable. The grace of God. Yes, we're going to find judgment in this parable. But underlying behind of all of that is God's amazing grace. So we find in verse 3 that he sent out his servants to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast. Now remember, Jesus is speaking, but there's a whole audience sitting all around him. But he is speaking to those Jewish leaders standing in front of him. He sent out servants to call those who had been invited. Now this is probably up to a year before that the initial calling or the initial invitation had been given. And throughout this whole year now, this betrothal period, they have been waiting for the wedding to take place, for the wedding to come. So they were initially invited long before the wedding was to take place. And now those who have been called are called again. They're invited to come because it is now time for the wedding celebration to take place. And it tells us there that they were unwilling to come. Now in, the, in your New Testament, in the Greek language, the word called is used there twice. It's translated called and invited, but it literally says to call those who had been called, called previously, called originally referring to the nation of Israel. They were the ones with the original call. God had promised them that one day a Messiah would come, a son of David, through the line of Israel. And so this is a reference to the Jewish nation, to the, Israel, to the Israeli people that he had called originally, and now the invitation has come out again. So God's advanced invitation was given to the Jews, was disregarded. They were called initially, previously. Now they're being called to come to the wedding. And it says they were not willing. Just like the son in the previous parable who said, I will, but didn't do it, didn't go. You see, there's a conflict, a battle that goes on constantly in the lives of people between God and themselves. There is God's will, and then man has his will. And we have to make a decision whether or not we're going to follow God's will or do what we want. And there's a choice. And the choice was not to come to the wedding. So we find in, in uh, verse 
4, he sent out other servants saying, tell those who have been invited, I have prepared my meal. My oxen and my fattened livestock are butchered and everything is ready. Come, come to the wedding feast. Previously, they had not come. They were no-show guests, invited but not coming. Now, in our day and age, you know, there's lots of weddings that you've been invited to, and sometimes you may be all excited to go, especially the wives, you know, they, women, they love to go to a wedding, and they sit and they cry when the bride comes down the aisle, and it's, you know, it's a wonderful, wonderful setting. But sometimes, for others, it's kind of a drag. But this is the king. This is the king's son. A royal wedding. We've heard about the young men that get cold feet and the jitters, oh, maybe just nervous or possibly even wondering about what kind of a commitment am I making here? Am I ready for this commitment? Am I ready to make and take these vows? Many of you may have seen the, the film The Runaway Bride who was constantly running away before her wedding ceremony. But this isn't about the groom and it's not about the bride, it's about the guests. And they're no-shows. They're not running away, they just are not willing to come to the wedding. And here we find God's, again, grace. This God of the second chance, he's giving them another opportunity. He actually called them many months before. Now he's called them a second time, now that the wedding is ready to start. And now this is his third, if you will, invitation to come to the wedding. And there's all this food. You know, today we have what's called wedding crashers. People that show up at a wedding reception because they know there's going to be good food there and they try to just kind of sneak their way in. These guys have got this wonderful meal. Uh, a couple of years ago, a few years ago, when we were at Isaiah's and Danny's wedding, you may remember they started off before they brought out the meal with donuts. And everybody was eating donuts before the meal. Last year, when we were at Caleb and Emily's wedding reception, some of you remember there were hamburgers with eggs on them. I'd never had that before. So people are doing all kinds of, but there's always food. That's not why you go, but that's part of the celebration. And here this king has prepared so well. And now he says to these people, Come, come to the wedding feast. And that word come is an invitation to come to the most important, important wedding. And remember, this is not about a wedding. It's about coming into the kingdom of heaven. That's the invitation behind this parable, behind the story. And notice what it says in verse Five and six, they paid no attention. They disregarded the invitation. They were indifferent. Oh, wedding, not interested. And they went their way, it goes on to say. They had other priorities. They had other things to do. The wedding of the king's son was not important to them. It was more important that they go to their farm or to their business. And so one goes to his farm, he's got crops to deal with. The other goes to his business, he's got money to make. I can't waste my time going to the wedding of the king's son. And so they were just indifferent. They weren't hostile, they were just indifferent. They didn't care, but notice what it says there, the rest a group of others who were invited to the wedding, by the way, seized 
his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. This is his third invitation for them to come to the wedding. And the messengers, they kill. Now, this is a little different than the previous parable where the messengers kept getting sent and they mistreated them. He sent the son and the son was killed. There's no mention of that here. But these servants, these are the ones who have come to, who were sent out to invite them. And, and you can't help but think of John the Baptist. John the Baptist appeared as the forerunner of the son of the Messiah, telling the people that they were to prepare. The kingdom of heaven was at hand and that they needed to repent of their sins because the king was near. And they killed him. And they will kill Jesus. And they will kill the apostles, the disciples. And so this nation of Israel that has been called to come to the feast, represented by these individuals, are rejecting the king, rejecting the king's son, rejecting the king's invitation. And they killed his servants. So the king's angry. Verse 7, the king's furious. It, it, it's not just that they've rejected, but they've killed his messengers, his servants. And so it says, he sent his armies, he destroyed the murderers, and he set their city on fire. Now remember, this is just a parable, just a story, but we will find within 40 years that this is what will happen. The Roman Emperor Titus will attack the city of Jerusalem, will burn the city to the ground, destroying the temple. 1.5 million Jews will be killed at the hands of the Roman Emperor. And so the parable, in some way, and that Jesus is speaking here, will find fulfillment in just a few short years. So the king then says to his servants, the wedding is ready. We still need to go on with the wedding. Those who were invited, they were not worthy. It's not that there was anything in them that would make them worthy. The only thing that would have made them worthy was accepting the invitation and coming. That's what would have made them worthy of coming to the wedding. It's not because of who they were, not because of the job they had, not because of how religious they were, but only based upon whether or not they were going to accept the invitation of the king. And so they were unworthy. And so now he goes on to say to his servants, invite others to come to the wedding. Invite others. After all, the wedding's still ready. We're still going to have the wedding. There's all this food. So he sends his servants out and he tells them, go to the main highways. Verse 9, go to the main highways and as many as you find there, invite them to the wedding. So God's grace continues. These are not the initial previously called people but now he's going to send his servants, his messengers out to the highways. And whoever you find, give them an invitation. Invite them to come to the wedding. And in verse 10, it says, the servants went out into the streets. The main highways, the streets, the crossroads, wherever you would find people. And he gathered together, they gathered together all the people that they found. Now, can you imagine if you were out there on the street and all of a sudden somebody is coming up to you and saying, the king wants you to come to his son's wedding celebration? The food is prepared. We would like for you to come. Th these people were not anticipating or expecting this invitation. 
And apparently, all of them were willing to go because it says the wedding hall was filled, packed with guests. The others said, no, we're not interested. We're not coming. And now you have all of these people out in the streets, the street people, the non-invitees who have now been invited. And notice it describes them by the words both evil and good. So here you have the, the good citizens of the city, those who are responsible, who go to their jobs, the bankers, the doctors, the lawyers, the teachers, the nurses, your neighbors, all of those who were good moral citizens. But what, then he includes the word evil. That's right. The prostitutes and the tax collectors and the thieves and the liars and the murderers and the adulterers, they have also been invited to come to the king's wedding celebration. Oh, do you see the grace? It's just like the two sons. The son that was a rebel initially and outwardly ended up obeying and doing the will of the father. And when John the Baptist was out crying to people, repent of your sins and be baptized, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They weren't just all good people. They were good sinners and bad sinners. All sinners. And so now you have the same situation where the good people and the evil people together, those that would maybe spend time in prison, and now they're out on the streets. And the servants call, and they all come to the wedding, invited by the king. Gracious invitation towards the sinful people of the city to come to the wedding. When the king came in, verse 11, to look over the dinner guests. Now, I, I, I am imagining the scene in my mind. There's this huge room that's called a hall, but a huge room. In fact, they used to, I think of a hall as like a narrow hallway, but a hall used to be a large, large gathering place. And the people are packed in and, and they're, they're visiting and talking and, and there's a lot of noise and commotion and all of a sudden there's a hush. It comes over the whole room. Somebody says, there's the king. The king has entered into the room. And standing next to him is his son. And as they enter into the room, there is immediate silence. And then in verse 11, it says, he saw a man. He saw a man. There were hundreds of men. Who knows how many men were in this packed hall. But it says, God or the king saw one man. And there was something about this man that stood out. And it had nothing to do with how tall he was, how big he was. The fact was he was not dressed in wedding clothes. The king looks out all over this auditorium and everyone there has wedding clothes on except for this one man. And from the king's perspective, he stands out like a sore thumb. He can't help but have his eyes land on this one man. Because the man has crashed the party. He doesn't belong there. Now the wedding clothes, there's some difference of opinion as to whether 
the people went home and put on their wedding clothes, or they came to the celebration and they were provided with wedding clothes. But whatever, the man thought that he could enter in to the wedding celebration without the wedding clothes. And he knew that you had to have the wedding clothes. Somehow, he hoped that he would not be spotted. Now remember, the Jewish people, those who were unwilling to come, some of them were indifferent towards the king's invitation. Others were hostile towards the king's invitation. This man is pretending, pretending to be interested in the king and his son. And there are many people who are living in a hypocrisy, a pretending to be believers in the king, believers in God and Jesus Christ. They may be part of the church and they're wearing a mask. And in this situation, Jesus is un, or the king is unmasking this individual who's pretending He's there based upon his own efforts and self-righteousness, believing that somehow he did not have to follow the pattern of everybody else by putting on the wedding clothes. Ever since you were a child, you learned that there were certain clothes for different purposes. When you were somewhere around five or six years old, you became aware that you needed to wear clothes. And ever since Adam and Eve sinned, and at that moment became aware of their nakedness, man has been wearing clothes. And we go off to school, and we have school clothes. In fact, as a child in Scotland, we had a uniform that we wore to school with a, a blazer and a certain sweater and certain shorts and socks. It was all part of the school uniform. You had to wear that to go to school. When I came to America, I noticed all everybody wore long pants, the boys. And I was excited about that because you didn't get to wear long pants till you were 12 over in Scotland. But if you went to school without a belt in junior high here, they would get a rope and make you put a rope through your loops. There were expectations about what you were gonna wear at school. Your parents also told you about the difference between school clothes and play clothes. What you could go outside and get dirty in or get the grass stains. You wore certain clothes when you went to bed to go to sleep. When you get older and all of a sudden you're off to work, there are certain work clothes, whether you're a farmer or whether you're a carpenter, whether you're a nurse or a doctor or a judge or a policeman. And if you're a baseball player, you don't go out on the field if you're not wearing your work clothes because it's part of a uniform. If you're involved with business, there are certain business clothes. Years ago, you heard about dress for success and, and the importance of, of dressing and what that meant for your business. Several years ago, I was driving from Weaverville down to uh, to San, San Jose and I was meeting my dad on the golf course to play around a golf and I showed up and he said, you need to change. You're not allowed to wear blue jeans. You've got to wear a, a shirt with a, a, a collar if you're gonna play on the golf course. There are cultural clothes. You go to Kenya, you go to Mexico, you go to Peru, you go to Scotland. There are cultural clothes. There were church clothes years ago. When I became a Christian as a teenager, all of the men wore a coat and tie. I came in my blue jeans. And after a period of time, I started putting on a tie. Just like I did when I went to work every day. There were church clothes. There are specific clothes you wear when you go to a funeral. 
For years, it was the color black, and women would wear a veil. But people would dress up for a funeral and for a wedding. You see, you had your good clothes. And for church, it was your Sunday best, they called it. Because you're going into the presence of God where you're best. It's not really about the clothes. It's about what's going on inside the heart. But there are clothes that you would wear to a wedding. And so it was in this day. There were wedding clothes. And so the king sees this man. And he says, how did you come in here without your wedding clothes? Can you imagine the whole crowd? Everybody is looking at this one man. Looking at the king. What is the king going to do? The man stands there speechless. There's nothing that he can say. And the king says, bind him hand and foot. Throw him into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He pretended. He came in deceitfully. And this is a picture of a description of hell. So we know that this parable is dealing with a lot more than a wedding. It's talking about the kingdom of heaven and those who will not be invited into the kingdom of heaven because they're not wearing the right clothes, they'll be cast out. And by the way, it has nothing to do with clothes. It has to do with wearing and being clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Those are the wedding clothes. Because once we read further in our New Testament, we understand that the only thing that will allow us into the kingdom of heaven is whether you're a murderer or whether you're a preacher. And the Apostle Paul was both. What enables you to enter into the kingdom of heaven, to celebrate the kingdom of heaven for all of eternity with the king and his son is to be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 13 says this, the night is almost gone, the day is near. Therefore let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. It's the picture of putting on some clothes. The clothes here is described as armor. And instead of putting on darkness, take darkness off and put on light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. The clothes that we're to put on is Jesus. The righteousness of Christ is the only means through which we can enter into the kingdom of heaven, into the presence of God. They are the wedding clothes. Galatians 3.27 says, All of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. That day that you prayed, confessing your sin and inviting Jesus to come into your life and be your savior. At that moment, you were baptized, you were placed into Christ, and at that moment, you were clothed with Christ. And therefore, you were clothed with the righteousness of Christ. So that one day when you stand before God, it, you're not there because of your righteousness. You'll, there'll be no pretending when we stand before God. He will see right through that. It's only because we are clothed with the righteousness of Jesus that we can stand before a holy God. Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 10 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul will exult in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. Old Testament prophets speaking about salvation, comparing it to clothes garments 
of salvation, a robe of righteousness. And when we came to know Christ, he clothed us with his robe, the robe of the Lord Jesus Christ and his righteousness. The wedding crasher was there pretending. He was not invited. He was, he was invited, but he did not come in with the wedding clothes. And we must make sure that we have put on Christ, that we are clothed with Christ, that we are wearing the robes of his righteousness, because someday we may enter into and stand before a holy God for him to say, depart from me, I do not know you into the outer darkness, into the place where there is gnashing of teeth, a place called hell, separated from God. And then he says in verse 14, for many are called, but few are chosen. Oh, all of the people that were called, but only those who responded, whether they were religious, whether they were good, whether they were evil sinners, all of those who responded to the invitation are the ones who are chosen. Many are called. The call has gone out. But only those who respond to the invitation and wear the garments of salvation and the robe of righteousness are those who will be chosen to enter into the kingdom of God for all of eternity. So the subject is God's kingdom. In God's kingdom, one day there will be a literal physical kingdom on this earth, following a period of tribulation. There'll be a thousand years where Christ will reign on this earth. But the kingdom of heaven is God being our king. He reigns in heaven. His throne is in heaven. He rules from heaven. But the kingdom is not here on the earth. But we who are his children, who have believed in him, we make up that kingdom. We are citizens of that kingdom. And at one point in your life, somebody came to the highway of your life, to the street of your life, and shared with you the gospel of Jesus Christ. You were a sinner, and they called you. They invited you to come to the wedding feast, to come to Jesus. And you humbled yourself, acknowledging your sin, and believing and trusting in Christ. And now we are the servants. We are the messengers. And as we go out into the highways and the streets and call people to come to Christ, there are those who will be indifferent. I'm not interested. I've got my farm. I've got my business. I don't have time to come to the wedding, to Jesus. There are those who will be hostile and will actually persecute the name of Jesus and the messengers of Jesus. And then there are many who are pretending, like a man named Judas, who eventually was unmasked for who he really was. Many pretenders who've gathered into the hall, if you will, of the church are not wearing the wedding clothes, the wedding clothes of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But what about the bride? This whole parable was about the guests, those who were invited. The son is Jesus, and he's not even really mentioned that much. The bride. All of the guests in that room that day that came in wearing the wedding clothes, those guests became the bride. You were invited by somebody to come to Christ. And Ephesians 5 says, the mystery is great, but I am speaking to you with reference to Christ and the church. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, his bride. 
The church as his bride is to submit to Christ. The whole point of the passage is that the church is the bride of Christ. So there's a sense in which in this parable, all of the guests who were initially not invited, but then later on invited, came and were wearing the wedding clothes. In turn, they will become the church. They become the bride. And even though the nation of Israel was rejected because of the rejection of the Messiah, the gospel went first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. So that in Acts, we see the gospel going from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth. So that 2,000 years later, you as an individual were invited to come to Christ. And in being invited and in believing in Christ, you became part of the bride of Christ, his church. And only, only because you are now wearing this robe of righteousness, the robe of righteousness provided by the Lord Jesus Christ when we put on Christ. A song was written back in 1835 by Charlotte Elliott. It's a song that years ago used to be sung often at the end of a service. Just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Just as I am and waiting not, to rid my soul of one dark blot, to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I come. Just as I am, though tossed about, with many a conflict and many a doubt, fightings and fears within, without, O Lamb of God, I come. Just as I am, thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve. Because thy promise, I believe, O Lamb of God, I come. You have been invited. to the kingdom of heaven. Not to a wedding. Oh, one day there will be a great wedding celebration when the bride joins the lamb, the son of God. But for the last 2,000 years, the invitation has constantly and continually gone out all over the world. Will you say, I have to go take care of my farm. I have my business. I don't have time. I'm not interested. And they were unwilling to come. Some are hostile angry. Our world is full of indifferent and hostile people towards the message of Jesus Christ. And there are people who may pretend. They may be in churches, but pretending. Oh, please make sure that you're wearing the garments of Christ. But maybe you're listening to this message and you have never understood. The invitation is for you not to come to the wedding, but to come to Christ. Because to come to Christ is to come to the kingdom of heaven, to come to the king, 
to come to his son, to have his presence in your life, to have forgiveness of your sin, because it's not about how good or how bad you are. We're all sinners, all needing a savior. You're invited today to come to Christ. Will you come? Will you believe in him, trust in him for salvation? If you have questions about that, please, will you call somebody that you know who's a Christian? In our world today, as it's been falling apart and people are getting angry and frustrated, our prayer is that many will turn their hearts toward God. He is the king, and he sent his son graciously to die for you, to take your place, to die on that cross as your substitute, that you might have a hope and a promise of eternal life. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you once again for the privilege of sharing your word. I pray, Father, that you would speak to all of our hearts. May those of us who are believers be rejoicing that when the invitation went out, we came. We came to Christ. We've been clothed in the robes of righteousness because we put on Christ. And one day we'll stand before you to never be sent away. Oh, Father, I pray that if there's somebody here today that's been pretending, listening today, pretending, break down the wall, break down the barrier, have them take off that mask. And Father, I pray that if there's somebody that has never trusted in Christ, that maybe today, God, you would help them to see the need to come to Jesus to find eternal life and salvation, to find purpose in life. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's go.